But then up here at the front, we have our commissioner candidates. Um, we had three of them that were available tonight. So we have Randy Weaverlin and Ted Jackson from District 1. And we have Richard Beckman from District 2. So, and Steve Dunkel, our Mason County Auditor, is going to be asking our questions this evening. Um, Curtis will be the timer. I'm going to hold up this 10 second warning. So you guys can watch right over here. I'll hold that up when you're close to your 10 seconds. And this is your time to stop, right? A pretty clear stop sign. Okay, so we'll do that. We're going to start with two minute introductions from each of you. And then we'll do a question. You'll each get a one minute answer time. And then after everyone answers the question, you all have an option of a 30 second rebuttal. So. And just one clarifying question for the 30, for the 30 second rebuttal or follow up. Do we follow the same sequence or? Yes. The question well, whoever, yes. Whoever, whoever, yes. Whoever, so, whoever. whoever has it, but yeah, we'll follow, you know, they each get, you don't have to use your rebuttal time if you're like, no good. But if you have it, then we'll follow the sequence, okay? Or whoever wants to use it. And I picked a number to see who goes first, right? A number between 1 and 20. So each of you get to pick a number. And whoever's the closest to my number will get to start us off. 17. You killed me. <laughs> 15. So, 1. OK. Looks like Ted's starting us off. It was 15. Good job. 17. OK. Uh, good evening. My name's Ted Jackson. To the right. Sorry. Go for it. OK. My name's Ted Jackson, and I'm running for District 1. I ran four years ago and had the pleasure of running against this gentleman. Uh, <coughs> him and I live about a couple of baseball throws away from each other. Uh, Randy's kids and my kids grew up together. Uh, had the pleasure of knowing him. 35 years in law enforcement. That's what I got the pleasure of doing. Uh, most of my career was spent out here in Mason County as a game warden. Uh, and so then uh, Fish and Wildlife decided to fire a bunch of game wardens. And so I was a Mason County deputy. Uh, and then I retired. Uh, retirement is a weird thing, but I retired. And I was blessed to get hired on with the United Way of Mason County. And so for the last four and a half years, I've been working at the United Way at Mason County, raising funds. And I'm glad to say today, uh, it should be in the newspaper, we got a $55,000 grant that I wrote uh, to help with our, uh, help with our planning. Uh, and so anyways, let's see, what else? I have two daughters, beautiful daughters. My wife's a physical therapist. Uh, and uh, I, I just love this community. I, I want to have fun up here tonight. So with Richard and Randy, We'll have fun. Please ask us any questions. Uh, I'm sure these gentlemen will say the same thing, but uh, let's have fun. So I want to see Mason County. I, I really do believe that we need a new jail uh, in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. When I was arresting people in 95, that jail was outdated. And then our transportation needs to improve. Uh, if you saw what was going on over the 4th of July, it was horrible. To just drive into Belfair, it was a mess to drive into Belfair. And I had to go get some screws for yard signs. Just a mess. And uh, so, anyways, I will back down. 10 seconds is over. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Oh, I'm up next? All right. Mm -hmm. Guess yeah, extra 17. Number 17. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm Richard Beckman. I am running for Mason County Commissioner, District Number Two. My wife, Kim, of 23 years, supports me on this crazy new adventure we're on. We want a better Mason County for your kids and grandkids and our kids and grandkids. Kim and four of my children were born, or our children, sorry, Kim, four of our children were born in Mason County. <clears throat> I wasn't, I moved here in 1995. I chose Mason County and this is my home. My son just graduated high school with two college degrees. One of my daughters has straight A's at college and is on the president's list. All five of our children are contributing to society and we're proud of each and every one of them. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. 
I have a dual foundation in both real estate and technology. As we know, real estate is closely controlled by politics. In fact, most of my adult life has been influenced by politics. When I was in construction, um, there was a slowdown in the timber industry due to the spotted owl. So I went to school on the dislocated timber worker program during the day, and I got my degree in information systems technology. I went to school at night for real estate. As we know, real estate became my passion. In the late 90s, there was a building moratorium because of growth management. So what I did is I pivoted again, and <coughs> ooh, uh, in the late 90s, I went to work for uh, Realtor.com. Uh, sorry, the dog got my train of thought all messed up. I apologize. <laughs> Ten more seconds. <laughs> anyway, late 90s, went to work uh, for uh, Realtor.com before they were a publicly traded company. I managed teams across multiple states as Realtor.com became a publicly traded company. I really enjoyed bridging my real estate and my technology background to help Realtor.com grow. And I enjoyed working for corporate America. In 2007, we purchased a real estate firm. Unfortunately, at the end of that year, the Great Recession hit. That tested my resolve and my ability to deal with adversity. Fortunately, I was able to purchase a real estate firm and two property management companies down, during the downturn. Past president of the Mason County Association of Realtors and endorsed by the Realtor, Washington State Realtors and the Farm Bureau. Okay. And many more. My name is Randy Netherland. I am one of the longest serving commissioners you've had, uh, especially in a row. Uh, we've only had a few that spent three terms in a row. We're a pretty rough community. Uh, we had one that did five overall. He did two, was thrown out. Did one, was thrown out. Did two, was thrown out. We're kind of hard to, to work for sometimes, but we are the greatest community that there is. I'm here by choice. I came here when I was 15. I basically ran away from home and I ended up in Belfair. The people in Belfair, literally, I was alone in a trailer with no power, no water. They took me in, they raised me. That's why I do everything I do today. Even though this job can be rough, it's worth it to try and pay back for all the time and all the love that they gave me in the community. I played football in North Mason. I went to school, I actually was even the SP president of the high school there. But more than that, it's just the way they take care of you. You live in one of the greatest places that there is. Please never forget it, because I never do. So in my 12 years of being a county commissioner, I've done some pretty impressive things. I've taken a lot of beatings. If you ever read in the, the paper, you saw how I took beatings from a, a different sheriff at the time, and I took different beatings for, from others, but somebody had to finally control the budget. We were absolutely broke. We were to the point to, in 2016, we were down in the middle of the year to $175,000 cash on hand. We had to stop cashing checks. That's not the way to be. With that, I had some great battles, but we found a way to cut the budget and live within our means like we're supposed to. I got it moved over to cash instead of accrual, so now this county does its budget like you do at home. Now, the state doesn't like that. They don't like that. They give us a letter every year saying that it's not appropriate and they don't care for it, but I tell them it's okay. Instead of 175000 a year, I got $25 million cash on hand now. We've done it right. We've absolutely done it the right way, even though they don't see it that way. I got to tell you, I appreciate everybody. I appreciate the people that are sitting next to me, all of them, even when I'm, I'm running against. I thank you for the opportunity. Where else you get a chance to stand up and try to do something incredible every day? So, Randy Nevin, thank you. Okay, so before we move uh, into the formal question and answer here, are you guys ready to have some fun? Mm -hmm. Before we get into it, I want to be sure to thank uh, the Take Back Mason County uh, team for inviting me to be your moderator tonight. I want to, uh, I want to thank Mason Web TV for, for broadcasting the event tonight.
you as voters, that you have confidence that we're, I'm going to run that election objectively, right? So I work really hard to not show any favoritism or preference or give any hints as to whom I might support. So that's important. The other thing is that as your auditor, it's really important to me that you guys are as informed as possible with the candidates on the ballot, with the measures on the ballot. This is one great way to get to know more. <laughs> said before, elections have consequences, and that's why we, we need an informed electorate. So we'll move into the questions here. We've got six questions that were prepared in advance. I didn't have anything to do with questions. I did throw one out. And we have two that were submitted by uh, a member of our viewing audience. And Rebecca, you've got two more? Um, not yet, but I do have blank sheets of paper. If you think of a question, I will set them at the back counter there. You can grab a paper. And write it down, and then hand it back to me. I'll be sitting here, and we'll get it to Steve. And yep. after our six questions, we'll follow up with audience questions. So, would anyone questions? like one right now? Back to back to Rebecca. Should we get a screen up? Make sure I don't get any landmines or hand grenades or anything like that. Let's hand it off. Okay. Are you guys ready? So, based on the the guess, the numeric guess here, we're going to start with uh, with. Uh, Mr. Ted Jackson for the first question, and it's a one related to policy. And the question is, what part of county government would receive more or most attention if you were elected? It would have to be the planning and our department and planning uh, and property. We have people trying to build homes that are waiting months to get permits or, or to get even an inspection. So I, I would do planning. And then the other thing is I would like to see us really enhance our EOC, our emergency management team. Uh, I think those people are way overworked. Uh, and we're just one match away from a huge fire in this county that's going to take a whole lot of effort. So uh, planning, definitely. And then emergency management would be my second choice. All right, so same question for you, Richard Beckman. What one part of county government would receive more or the most attention if you were elected? Yeah, um, like I've said before, um, Washington State is ranked 50th in the nation for available housing. We need to streamline the building permit process and, and make, make it so it's easier to create housing, affordable housing, and start jobs, job creation as well. Okay. And wrapping it up, uh, Commissioner Netherland, what one part of county government would receive more or the most attention if you were elected? The same as it is right now. As county commissioner, the very first care that you have is to take care of and watch over the monies. By handling and, and being smart with your finances, that's where you have the money to be able to uh, invest in law enforcement is a great example. When I first came in, it was $9.7 million. We currently have $17.8 million budget for our law enforcement. You heard stories about three, four, five officers. I have 53 commissioned deputies on our books, plus an additional 27 corrections officers, plus an additional five civil service officers. But you have to be able to get control of your money first, start to put it away so you can reinvest it out into housing, into uh, emergency management. I agree with everything they said. But in order to do that, we have to start with the money. Yep. Okay. And now we have uh, 30 seconds each for uh, rebuttal or additional commentary. We'll start back with you, Ted. You know, I, I, I'm lucky to be around two good gentlemen. So tonight, I, I really appreciate everybody being here. The, these gentlemen are, are, I got to meet Richard a uh, couple of months ago, and, uh, or a month ago, and uh, two great guys. So, when we talk about law enforcement, I remember the days where I, I remember the days where I was the only deputy or the only police officer in Mesa County, and those were the days. So, thank you, Rebecca. I'm done. <laughs> Richard, thirty seconds for you. All right. Um, yeah, on the funny side of things, I've uh, toured the uh, youth detention center, the jail, some other departments in the county as well. And, you know, uh, keep
keeping and retaining good employees as well as part of that budget. And so I like to find a way to be able to keep the people that we have and keep them from leaving and going to surrounding counties as well. And then Rand. I have nothing to rebut. What they said is actually accurate and, and correct. Uh, one of the things I, what he said, there was a time in Mason County when he was literally the only one on the streets. That's not a joke. That actually was happening. I remember going before I got elected. Uh, I remember going downstairs into one of their, their lower ones when they were still in the courthouse, and all the tables and chairs were there in pieces. They saved them so they could put more tables and chairs together. You remember that? Uh, it was literally that bad. So I'm not rebutting anything. They're correct in what they said. It's accurate. We've just come a long way, haven't we? We have. <laughs> Yes. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. We'll make it so. Okay, so here we go with our second question, and we start with uh, Richard Beckman. What are the three most important things you plan to do as a Mason County Commissioner to help attract new business and support existing businesses in Mason County? Um, great question. Uh, well, I mean, to start off, oh, stand yeah, please stand, stand up. Stand up. All right. Thank you. There we go. So uh, to start off, if we're going to promote uh, jobs and job growth, we need housing to, to house the people that are going to work for these. So uh, with housing, definitely. Um, working with uh, small businesses, uh, there's all kinds of funding options and, and ways to support our small businesses. So uh, find ways to come up with those funds and, and push for small business development. Um, and then uh, um, number three, getting out there in the community and meeting with the members of our community to find out what you guys want so we can make sure that we drive this community in the right direction. All right, very good. So we move to uh, Randy, same question. What are the three most important things you plan to do as a Mason County Commissioner to help attract new business and support existing businesses in Mason County? Well, we continue to do what we've already done when it comes to our existing businesses. When we had the COVID and we had the big issues happen, we were given a lot of money and almost every single county just ate that money up. We did not. We reinvested it back into the community. That's why we didn't lose restaurants. That's why we didn't lose businesses during the COVID like every other county did. So we have to continue to remember that we're here to help serve them and to work with them. That's number one. Number two is what's mentioned. Uh, housing. I don't know if you understand and know, but uh, the two most important key factors when anybody comes in for a new company and what they're looking for is utility rates is number one, but number two is an educated workforce. Now to have that, you have to have housing. Uh, we're already working, we've been all each talking about bringing in some of the smaller houses so we could have workforce housing. That would help us to bring in new businesses. Also, the one last thing that I want to throw in is the idea of when they do want to come in, they got to build big buildings. We need to find ways to streamline that like by letting them uh, hire their own inspectors from companies out there or making engineered blueprints count as engineered and not have to be redone. Okay, so now for a 30 second uh, rebuttal and or follow up, Richard? I'm good. Uh, I think Ted was. Yeah. Go ahead, Ted. Richard, Randy, then Ted. Yeah. Uh, you know, transportation, digital equity, and housing. Uh, we talk about housing in Mason County. This is a bedroom community, folks. It really is. My youngest, oh, my oldest daughter just bought a house in Port Orchard. 570, or excuse me, $535,000 for a, a lot that's smaller than my kitchen. And good luck trying to buy something in Allen. Transportation in this county is horrible. Uh, we need to improve transportation. Uh, I know anybody that's going to go down Johns Prairie Road and try to merge on to State Route 3, good luck tonight. And please be careful. Uh, that is a horrible intersection. It needs to be swapped over. We need to do something. So digital equity, when we saw it in COVID, our kids were going up to Dewato, to Huya. Uh, they were trying to find internet service. We need to improve our digital equity in this county. I wrote a grant for $55,000 on top of the other 55,000 
to improve digital equity in this county. So, thank you. We absolutely agree on that one. I gotta tell you, during COVID, one of the other great investments we did is we actually took money and invested it into Wi-Fi throughout the county whenever we could so that people could have that access. What you may not understand is we have a lot of businesses of which we collect sales tax on that moved here because of the COVID issue and they had to have access because although their office was in Seattle, they could work from here. One of the funny things you may not notice is that we're having an issue when it comes to housing and uh, selling and pricing again because a lot of those people are finding they're being called back to work. So they are leaving so that people that were here to buy them before are not here to buy them today. But being able to have that access will help to grow our community and keep tax money here. Okay, you might as well stay standing right here. The, the next question, you, you lead us off. So, um, what are your ideas and or plans to continue to promote and preserve farms, farmland, aquaculture, forestry, and other agricultural businesses in Mason County despite the incoming surge in business and residential development? Okay, so they're not, not all things are equal there. Because you have development does not mean you have to take away and lose your natural resources. Currently in the state of Washington, they have uh, a growth management act that covers that. So if you have big, large developments, they're not going to happen in the rural areas anymore because they're not allowed to at this point. We do have to release some of that a little bit, though, because it's stifling growth and it's creating spread. But you can literally, right now, you can have these things, but you have to have an in an urban growth area. That's where it goes. So it's not going to have that great impact where one's eaten away at the other. But again, uh, it's the backbone of our community. You know, granted, it's not the big money makers that it used to be, but when you put them all together, it's still what keeps Mason County afloat. If you don't protect those, you're not going to have the jobs, and we're not going to have the money at the county to have the other jobs to be able to help you to do anything else. So we have to protect them. And one of the things we need to do is start a, a ag committee here in, in the county. And what we're done, we've never had a chance to talk about that, but the Farm Bureau had brought that up. An ag committee will allow us to work within their system to do what's best for them and not take them for granted. Okay, very good. Ted, same question for you. Uh, I, uh, what, I'll read you the question here. What are your ideas and or plans to continue to promote and preserve farms, farmland, aquaculture, forestry, and other agricultural businesses in Mason County despite the incoming surge in business? For one thing, what I would do is make sure we extend, we have tree farms. And Mesa County is known for our tree farms. I would send the sales tax to make sure our tree farmers that are out there are protected. Two is we have oyster clam beds that surround Hood Canal and Puget Sound. For most of my career, I was out there with DOH for uh, making sure those uh, farms were protected. We need to have sections of beach where oysters, if you know an oyster, oysters filter out the water, they can take the contaminants out of the water, and it's a good money maker. So I, uh, I would protect those folks too. And it, it's, it's a broad question, Steve, but at the same time, this is what our county is built on, is agriculture, farmlands. Uh, we don't have the cattle like we used to. Uh, used to, but uh, we need to protect those folks. They have livelihoods, we need to protect them. So Very good. All right, Richard, same question. What are your ideas and or plans to continue to promote and preserve farms, farmland, aquaculture, forestry, and other agricultural businesses in Mason County, despite the incoming surge in business and residential development? Um, well, uh, for the farmlands, basically what we need to do is kind of loosen some of the uh, uh, building permit restrictions so they can build their barns and their, their hay barns and the things like that loosen up from that standpoint. Um, as for the, uh, you know, the growth that's coming in, I mean, a great opportunity, like Randy said, is within the UGA and developing within the UGA, right down here off of Capitol Hill, we could extend our water and sewer system. We've got all kinds of acreage here where we could funnel and have that development right here in Mason County. Up in uh, Belfair, there were two county commissioners, uh, only uh, the one that's sitting here with me tonight isn't one of them, but uh, voted to spend six to $10 million on extending that sewer system up there. And over the past year and a half, nobody's even connected that system. 
Right here, right now, we can extend those services and start housing development so we can have jobs for forestry, for shellfish, and all the other things you mentioned. Okay, and for 30 seconds. As he said, I stood against that uh, expansion. The reason why is the county's not in business to, to speculate. We don't spend your money for a developer for his property so he can benefit from that. That's not how our money should ever be spent, so that's why I stood against it. Uh, environmental, as he's saying, uh, sounds good, the word sounds good, but sometimes it could actually kill farming. You have a situation like he's talking about where they're not allowed to build barns and stuff out where they have their farmlands, and right now I want you to know our county's collecting money from these aquaculture things. We're collecting up to $4 million on a contract that I was able to put together outside the box where we lease our county land to them and we collect a part of, of the, the proceeds for Gooey Duck. And Ted, 30 seconds for you. Yep, yeah, uh, I'm glad Randy brought up Gooey Duck because that's one of our biggest industries in this county is Gooey Duck farming. Uh, if you go down to Victor and uh, we need clean water. I pushed, before I left the Port of Allen, I pushed to get all the pilings out of, uh, the crease of pilings out of uh, uh, North Bay. So that's right. I, I'm an environmentalist, folks. So <laughs> thanks. Uh, Richard, 30 seconds for you. All right. So if we were able to extend that sewer system down uh, John's, or not John's Prairie, but uh, Capitol Hill, we can charge connection fees, and then we can use those fees to reinvest and then extend our, our infrastructure within our UGA and help develop and bring in more housing and more job opportunities. All right, with our next question, we start with Ted. If someone came to you with a proposal to build a new piece of infrastructure in Mason County, road, bridge, sewer, etc., how would you evaluate whether or not that project was worth implementing? First off, I would want to make sure it benefit the whole community. Uh, and I hope somebody would propose those. Uh, I look at North Mason, like I said, North Mason in Belfair area is a bedroom community. Uh, people commute to Bremerton, Gig Harbor, Tacoma. Uh, I used to commute to DuPont. But uh, I would ask, does it benefit the community? If somebody would ask me, Ted, tomorrow, let's do a study on State Route 3 and let's figure out how we can improve State Route 3. Uh, it's a horrible road. Uh, I would be more than happy because I know it would benefit everybody here. And so, or Ted, how do we, we talk about the Belfair Bypass. I know Commissioner, gosh darn it, I, I talk too long. Uh, Commissioner, <laughs> I've been dealing with this, but I would love to see us, Belfair, just straight shot to Gorse, straight shot to Gate Harbor. Thank you. Amen. All right, Richard, same question for you. If someone came to you with a proposal to build a new piece of public infrastructure in Mason County, road, bridge, sewer, etc., how would you evaluate whether or not that project was worth implementing? Um, well, it's better to be proactive than reactive. So we need to be thinking ahead so when those plans come in that we're prepared to make those decisions. We need to be out talking to our constituents and finding out what our citizens really need and, and want for the area as well. And then funding is another issue that we need to uh, take a look at and make sure we have the funding for that, that program. Um, and, and so uh, I, think, um, I think that covers it. Mm -hmm. Okay, did I get a sequence? We go. it's Randy's turn, right? Randy, same question for you. If someone came to you with a proposal to build a new piece of public infrastructure in Mason County, road, bridge, sewer, etc., how would you evaluate whether or not that project was worth implementing? So that question is a reality for me, because I'm already in that job, and th those questions do come up. So the first question that you have to ask, number one, is it needed? Because look at the, that sewer pipe going up into nowhere. Was that needed? We invest money. We borrowed money to build that. Was that needed? Number one. Number two, how many will benefit from it, as they talked about? How much will it cost? 
And then the other question is, can you partner with other entities to offset the cost? Right now we're looking at doing Razor Road. It's a concept I've been working on for years since I came here. Razor Road will allow for a whole other access from Highway 3 that can get you all the way to Olympia, going a, a whole back way through, through Mason Lake area and all like that. That would be done through what's called an RID, a road improvement district. A road improvement district is a partnership with the people that live there because they'll benefit, their property values will go up, they already have a road agreement they have to pay for, and the county who will have many citizens that will benefit. Oh, sorry. 30 seconds. She, she, she cut me off with the wrong one. <laughs> wrong one. <laughs> it's all good. I would like to comment. Uh, although we're running against each other, Razor Road needs to be improved. Uh, that section of road is horrible. Uh, Commissioner Netherland knows that. I know it. Uh, and if you actually, you could drive from Allen to the uh, ocean by crossing the asphalt twice. Uh, used to have keys that used to get me up there. But Razor Road needs to be improved. And I still believe our biggest problem in Mesa County is our transportation. So, thank you. Over to you, Richard. All right. So I started off saying being proactive instead of reactive. Uh, you know, it seems like there's a lot of money that spend on studies. I mean, with the Belfair Bypass, I mean, they did study after study after study before they got that going. I'd like to be proactive. I mean, let's get the study done and let's get the work done. Instead of just sit back and spend, you know, 100000 on this study and 100000 on that study. So let's get it done. And Rick. So as a rebuttal, which is not a rebuttal, uh, the reason why Ted knows the importance is because he's from here. I, I cannot tell you how much difference that makes. Richard's from here. No, not born here, but they've been here for years. They're invested here. They know what the community is. They know where the roads are. They know where the people are in trouble. It's important that you recognize that when you're picking on who you're going to vote for. Uh, we have people that are running right now that that's not an issue for them. They just moved here. They uh, joined a few communities. Next thing you know, they want to run the, the whole world. That's fine, but to take care of us, you must first be here. You must first know us. Then you can take care of us. All right, very good. Moving on to the next question, we start with Richard Beckman. What would you do to address the serious opioid slash transient issue facing Mason County? Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, the first thing I would do is I would uh, make it illegal, which there's already some laws in place already, uh, for camping in public places. Uh, that's one of the things that we need to uh, do to start getting these uh, people out of our county. Uh, the other options are, um, you know, Randy came up with a good idea, uh, giving individuals the option to leave the county and go to a different county so don't, we don't have to uh, deal with those individuals. It's gonna save us on the budget cost as well. Um, but really, uh, um, it's about mental health and, and drug counseling as well. And um, I know up on the north end uh, with the fire department up there, when the fire department goes out, they've got this uh, great group that deals with both the mental health issue and the um, addiction issue. And they're able to help the citizens when they're out there in the parks and meeting in the homes as well. All right, next we move to Randy Netherlands. What would you do to address the serious opioid slash transient issue facing Mason County? Okay, there is no magic wand, guys. You're not just going to come up with a good solution and make it happen. The only thing we can do is a little piece at a time. As he was talking about, one of the things that I've been looking at and looking for, and some will tell you that you can't do it, but let me ask you a question. Somebody gets arrested for shopping at Walmart, and they decide not to prosecute, and they say, hey, we won't prosecute you if you don't go back into Walmart. It's the same type of thing that I'm talking about as a non-prosecution agreement. If you're caught, we change things down to a, a uh, misdemeanor instead of the, the uh, felonies. Number one, we have the whole state coming down on us on our public defenders. Got to cut down the ability that they can actually public defend down to nothing. And then we're going to be in a situation where we're letting people go because we cannot prosecute them because we cannot defend them. In order to do more, we need to lower them down to a misdemeanor because now instead of 47 credits, you can get 280 credits, which gives you a lot better ability to do something with it. But again, it would be just to get it done quick, uh, uh, a simple fine, uh, find a way to uh, get in, into some type of rehab, 
or go ahead with an opportunity to leave for six months, come back, and, and your whole thing will be expunged if it's agreed upon but with the prosecutors. Okay, Ted Jackson, same question. What would you do to address the serious opioid slash transient issue facing Mason County? So, the, you know, this question I thought about, how much money does Mason County want to spend for alcohol, drug addiction, homelessness? It's, it's how much Mason County wants to spend. I was very blessed when I was a police chief in DuPont. We didn't have homelessness. Why? Because the mayor, myself, and the city administrator said, anybody that comes into this town that doesn't have a home gets either shipped to Olympia or Tacoma. How callous is that? But we didn't have the infrastructure in DuPont to have a food bank, uh, medical, and we don't have it up in North Mason. We, if you have homeless up in North Mason, we have to transport them to Gate Harbor or Bremerton. How much cost does it take to get us up there? So my deal is no camping in public places, and let's try to figure out how to get these people that want help to get help. So. Okay, for a 30 second follow up, Richard. <laughs> Well, I'm all for a hand up, not a handout. There are a lot of services here in, in our county and it seems to attract um, quite a few homeless. So uh, we need to find a way to give them a hand up and, and get them on their feet instead of keep giving them handouts. And Randy, 30 second follow up. Is it working right now? If nothing changes, nothing will change. So we have to do some things to, to make some change happen. And I want to make it clear, we're not talking about going after homeless. We're going, talking about going after people that are breaking laws and then punishing them for breaking the law. We're giving these opportunities for the laws they break, not because they're homeless. There are some great homeless people out there that one young lady wearing a piece of jewelry to protect herself from being violated when she passes out has a ring that goes through her nose and comes out of her mouth in order to protect her. We need to protect her, right? <laughs> if that person's sitting next to you, I can get, they can get mad at me, Kids of County, I just want to get them away from you. I'm Mason County Commissioner. It's that simple for me, and I'm sorry if, for those that get mad at me for that one, but my job is to protect you. Yeah, yeah, you know, the last four years, I was United Way. We have homeless come in constantly, and thanks to the good nature of our community, we were able to provide some homeless needs. But I'm sorry. At 35 years as a cop, I've seen it all. I, I literally have. I am not that sympathetic when it comes to, you need help, let's get you going, you need help. And if you look at our homeless situation, we reduced the bed size of Western State. People need help, folks. I, I, I'm sorry, they do. So, thank you. Okay. Very good, so that brings us to our next question. We start with Randy Nettleman. Do you support or oppose any sort of health slash vaccine passport or other means of implementing a social credit system tied to people's health and personal medical decisions? No, no, no. Uh, but now, uh, there's something I want to tell you because there's going to be people out there that are going to talk about some of the other things I've done. I am not uh, a pro-vaccine person, but I'm not an anti-vaxxer either. And you need to understand that. The reason why I'm not, because I'm representing you. There are those in the room that definitely are against it. There are those in the room that were terrified and felt they needed to save their life. I ended up helping 3,000 people get their vaccines. We had buses in Belfort that were taking all the elderly. These are the ones that wanted it. I didn't want to force anybody to do anything, but if they wanted my help, they got it. But if they also wanted my help to help protect them in our workplace so they could keep their privacy, I did that. You've got to be able to balance it, guys. It can't be just one or the other because you're not just one or the other. You are all different, so we have to treat you different and treat vaccines different. But definitely, nobody needs to know your business, your medical business, and I don't want them knowing mine, and I don't want to know yours. So, no, no, no. Okay, Ted Jackson, same question. Do you support or oppose any sort of health slash vaccine passport or other means of implementing a social credit system tied to people's health and personal medical decisions? How do you spell no? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. <laughs> my philosophy is my personal health uh, is my personal health. My wife is in the medical uh, profession, 
and she has to take precautions for her patients. My health, as she will tell you, is my health, and my daughter's health are their health. So, no, cry out loud, no. <laughs> Thank you. And do I get just joking? <laughs> Back to the same question. Do you support or oppose any sort of health slash vaccine passport or other means of implementing a social credit system tied to people's health and personal medical decisions? Uh, what was it? No, no, and no. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, uh, the vaccine at the time, that was the, the best available science, so they said. And it wasn't. You know, they kept trying to shove that down our throat. You need to have free will, free choice to do with your body what you want. If you want the, the jab, get the jab. But don't make me get the jab, because that's what you want. You're you, I'm me, and let's be free Americans and do what we want to do. Wow. Okay, so to simplify it again, you have the right in this country, even though sometimes they seem to want to take it away on both sides of this spectrum here. You have the right to live the way you want to live, the way you think you should live, and they don't have the right on either side to tell you how you must live. That's the part we have to remember. So if you disagree with somebody on the other side right now, have a little patience, have a little understanding, because they're entitled to that same belief. And especially when somebody's afraid, you gotta have a little bit of leeway to them because that could be you afraid next time. So never forget that, guys. Ted, Are you going to shut us down again? We never did shut down. Not Mason County. Ted, 30 seconds. No, never shut us down again. As a community, as a United States citizen, never shut us down again. Never, ever. Uh, I, I'm very proud of the work we did at the United Way is that we kept it open. And I will tell you a personal story is that I'm going to tell my health story. Uh, but my daughter graduated from the University of Montana. To go over to the University of Montana, I had to get a shot. Next day I was in COVID in a bed in Missoula, Montana. So, <laughs> sick, so. And Richard, 30 seconds. All right. So yeah, like I said, I'm all for free choice. No to shutting down. You look at what happened to the kids. I mean, they're afraid to touch people. They still want to wear their masks. It's been really detrimental to the kids in school. And so for shutdown, I would say no, no. It's America, we have a free choice. Uh, we don't want to be hurt economically. We don't want to hurt our youth again as well. So uh, no to that all the way. Okay. So that concludes our six questions that were prepared in advance. Now we move, to, move into the questions that were submitted by members of the audience. Rebecca, how many do we have? I have one, two, three. There's a couple on some okay. of them, so now I'll keep this going. Did anybody else want to write down a question at this time? We'll get you a pen and paper. I'll be watching on TV. So. Anything else? Yeah, she, uh, she's been to everything. Yeah, all right, we'll get started for the sake of flow here. She's so, been to everything. Uh, first, and I'm not going to read all the background, but the next two questions really pertain to the, the decision that was made uh, for the Belfair sewer expansion. And so the first question, starting with uh, Ted Jackson. Thank you. Since the sewer extension was put across private property instead of running along State Route 3, will you as commissioner negotiate an easement that brings the connection down to the road, Highway 3, in order to allow other property owners a place to connect to the extension of the sewer? I, I believe that's a public utility, so yes, I would agree to do that. Uh, when we expanded the State Route 3 through Belfair, I'm surprised we didn't do the sewer system through there. Um, we needed to run that line uh, through the property and there is private property all around State Route 3. You have DNR, you have private property and I could mention their names but I won't. Uh, it shouldn't benefit one person. It should benefit the whole community. So yes, I, I, would, uh, I would expand it 
to let people uh, have access to it. So. Okay, Richard, same question. Will you as commissioner negotiate an easement that brings the connection down to Highway 3 in order to allow other property owners a place to connect to the extension of the sewer? Absolutely, yeah. We need to make that uh, sewer system make a, a turn and, and turn it down where we can have people connecting and using the system. And when I'm elected as commissioner, I'm not going to vote to extend that sewer system to Kitsap County. That would help them out economically, and that's not what I would be in office to do. My job is to help the citizens of Mason County. So we're going to turn that system and plug it right into downtown and the other areas where there's not service so we can have growth where it needs to be in Belfair and not in Kitsap County. 30 seconds for a follow-up. Should we should be starting with 10. Oh, wait, Randy. Yeah. I'll wait. I'll, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take a minute. Sir. <laughs> okay, so uh, currently right now, the end of that, that line comes out to the traffic circle up there or by it, so we can't get access across. The problem is, is people across the street, when they were talking about uh, how will we get over there, they said, well, if you want to have sewer going, you have to pay for it. They have to pay for theirs, but they didn't pay for theirs. That's always going to be the issue. I want to go back uh, for a moment on the last one and let you know the county itself never closed down nobody. The state did. The county or the state tried to make us actually enforce it, and we chose to tell them that there's no rule or mandate that, that we have to enforce it because we can't. We didn't have those rights or ability and, and wasn't looking to get it, just to let you know. So before we move into the 30-second rebuttal, I want to apologize. I got, so you guys know, I was reading ahead to some of the other questions, and I lost you can leave me out. I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for 30 second follow up, starting with Ted. Uh, I just got our uh, Belfair sewer bill today. It's not pretty. And I'm sure you got yours the other day. It is not pretty. I was against the Belfair sewer system from the beginning. Uh, we had a septic tank where we used to live, and then we built a house we had to do with the sewer. But now I see the water quality uh, improving in North Bay, and I'm more than happy. Yes, make it accessible. Thanks. Three seconds, Richard. Yeah, so uh, let's uh, get that sewer system turned around, headed in the right direction so we can get everyone connected up there that needs to be connected so we can have growth in Mason County. Okay, it's never an answer, but boy, you ought to see the other guy. Uh, look at poor Shelton right now. How much are you paying right now, George? Hundred. Yeah, that's included as water. So it's horrible what we have, but it's you know you ought to see the other guy. But uh, we actually just lowered uh, North Bay for the first time ever. But we still, unless we're investing in things that are already there, we can't do it like a pig in a poke and just say, okay, we're going to go to an area that has no buildings and we're going to build there. You can't get grants by speculation. If there was buildings, so we get grants from the state. They help cover the cost of that. Without that, why would you? You have to go with there's already somebody to hook up. All right. I believe that brings us to our next question. And we start with Richard. And the question is this. Are you in favor of a further expansion of the sewer into Kitsap County for commercial and or industrial use? If so, at <laughs> I just answered Wait, that. No. Yeah. no. At whose cost, including uh, overspray easement area for the extension that will be Okay, I didn't catch the overspray. I'm sorry, one more. Are you in favor of a further expansion of the sewer into Kitsap County for commercial and or industrial use? If so, at whose cost, including easement, overspray, extension, etc. that will be um, I am at, not at all in favor of extending that system into Kitsap County. I want to keep the growth here in Mason County. Uh, that's going to help our local economy. Um, as a small business owner, I realize how important it is to shop local. If we extend that system over into Kitsap County, they're going to open up, who knows, a shopping mall, businesses, and things like that. I'd like to keep that development right here in Mason County to help our local tax base. Um, that's going to help us fund our services, um, more sheriffs on the street, more fire department, more services overall for, for our citizens. So. I want to keep all that right here in Mason County, and there's no part of me that sees extending that system to Kitsap County. 
Okay, Randy Netherland. Are you in favor of a further expansion of the sewer into Kitsap County? No, no, no. Uh, something you have to know about that, though, so you can understand. It's not that I'm just being a jerk, just don't want it up there. That's not it. I don't care who gets rich and who gets wealthy. What I do have to make sure is that we don't go poor because of it. I, as I said earlier, my job is to protect us. My job is not to be all worldly and to, and to take care of Kitsap County. I'm sorry, my job is to take care of Mason County. During COVID, uh, when all these places were shut down and the state uh, did all that, uh, we were one of the only counties that flourished. We flourished very well because of little companies like McClendon's and Mitchell Lumber in Belfair. Now, normally before COVID, they were doing one to three trucks a week. During COVID, they were doing 17 trucks a week, all of it taxable. All of it taxable. I only collect about 10 million in the general fund from your property taxes. You pay a lot, but it goes to the state, it goes to schools. We pay 10 million for the, for the, for the county. We get about 10 million in sales tax. Sales tax is what we use for our law enforcement and all these other things when you have a budget of 17.8 million. You build one, one uh, Home Depot on top of the hill, I lose Mitchell and McClendon. I lose their sales tax, I lose their property tax, I lose their ERUs, we lose jobs. It makes no sense. Why support your name, the, the one that's gonna compete against you? Okay, Ted Jackson, same question. Are you in favor of a further expansion of the sewer into Kitsap County for commercial and or industrial use? No, and I'll tell you why is, if anybody's driven up through uh, North Mason, you see the airway expansion going on. And that's all because of Amazon. How much money from Amazon, besides where we get our parcels, is coming into Mason County? I love uh, Ace Hardware and Belfair. If you tell me, Ted, where are you gonna go tonight? I go to Ace. Uh, that is my favorite shop, and I go there constantly. So. I want to see our small business owners thrive. I don't want to see an expansion going up into Kitsap. If Kitsap offered billions of dollars to expand that sewer system, I would have to think again, but it's not happening. So I don't want to be a bedroom community supporting Kitsap County at all. Thank you. Okay, and now that moves us to the 30 second follow up starting with Richard. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy. Chevy would never let Ford use their plant to make their product. Why would we do that? That doesn't make any sense again. So no, no, and no. That's how we protect us. I'll have to applaud. That was a great answer, but no, 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 ditto, ditto, ditto. Yeah. So, no, I, I don't think it's wise for North Mason County to expand. I, I was asked a couple of months ago, shouldn't Belfair or Allen become incorporated? And I go, well, that's a big question. Uh, and I said, that's not bad, but we need a police department. We need all this stuff. We need mayors. We need council members. Do we want to pay for that? No. No. Thank you. <laughs> Alright. So these are these are a little edgy here, folks. I'm gonna try to uh -oh. Uh -oh. put a little bit of, of uh, insight into here. So next question from the uh, audience starts with Ted. And it is this in light of our experience with COVID, what are the things that you disagree with and how would you do it differently? One, I would never lock our kids out of school. And I'll tell you a personal reason, and Rebecca, please keep that down. <laughs> My youngest daughter went to college, and I watched all those freshmen go through the COVID protocol. They were locked down. They had no room to move. They were in their dorm rooms. They had no places. By the way, I, if, if you want to see an Uber, uh, my daughter knows Uber in Missoula. So, uh, and, and it was so darn expensive for our, our community. So no, I, I, would, I would say, you know what, folks, we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect ourselves, whether or not you agree with the vaccination, or whatever. Never lock us down again. Absolutely not. And uh, I am so proud of my office staff. We never shut down, so. All right. Richard Beckman, in light of our experience with COVID, what are the things you do with which you disagree, and what would you have done differently, or what would you do differently? Um, well, like I said earlier, I mean, it's 
free choice. It's your body, it's my body, you have the free choice to do with as you please. I would not have shut down like we did. We hurt our kids, we hurt our businesses, and we hurt our economy. We have all this inflation going on because of all the money that was rolled into the economy because of the shutdown as well. Um, so I would, uh, that's what I would change. Um, like I said, we're Americans, free choice. If you want the jab, you take it, but don't tell me I have to get the jab. You do you and I'll do me. And 30 seconds for follow up. Oh wait, Randy. <laughs> Randy, in light of our experience with COVID, <laughs> what are the things with which you disagree and how would you do differently? Okay, so I want to say I disagree with most everything that happened on that, but that's hindsight being 2020. There were a lot of people that called me at 4 o'clock in the morning absolutely terrified because you'd be shocked how many times when you are afraid you're sitting in bed for the season be 4 o'clock in the morning when you're losing your stuff. And my phone number's out there to everybody, so I can tell you there were a lot of terrified people. So I try to have compassion and understand that when I realize how they acted and how they were reacting to it. But at the same time, mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. I think most of us knew that some of that stuff was not going to be working. It was going to backfire. We knew when we were doing it, but at the same time, you survive and you do the best that you can. I want you to know that during COVID, unlike anybody else, I never left the people. Okay, I was out there with them on the street with George and his daughter and stuff holding our signs when people were terrified and saying that, be kind, we're going to be okay. And people were crying and going by us because they hadn't been able to talk to anybody. They're literally driving by in the car crying and stuff. I'm on the, on the stoop with uh, giving food baskets to elderly folks that were shut in because they're afraid if they went outside, they're going to die. So when you think, keep that in mind, you've got to have a little compassion for how they ended up. But no, I would not want to do any of that stupid stuff again. Now for three second follow-up. Ted. Yeah, I, I, I can agree. Uh, we went through, 1916, we had the bird flu pandemic, and then we had the COVID pandemic, and I hope we never, as citizens, go through that stuff again. I, I, I was blessed. I didn't lose anybody, but I never want to go through that again. And no, I would never shut the community down. So thank you. Richard, 30 seconds, all right. Yeah, COVID was horrible. We lost a lot of good people, and, and I'm sorry that that happened to so many families. Um, but the fact is, is we still have to have our own free will and our own free choice to do with as we see fit. So that's it. And 30 seconds to you, Randy. Everything ends up coming to equilibrium at some point. We had to go through this in order to get where we are today. I just thank God that we actually made it out okay. And I'm not afraid to say I thank God that we made it out okay. Amen. Because I'll tell you what, in the middle of those days, I was down on my knees just like I am every night, but I really was as I lost my neighbor across the street. There was a reality to this. It isn't just all the stuff we try to remember and how horrible it was. There was a reality, but we always t seem to take things a little too far. Whenever we're trying to fix something, don't we? Isn't that what the government always does? I'm a government, I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, our next question from the audience. Um, how would, and we're starting with Richard Peppin, how would you propose to stop drug availability on, on Mesa Transit buses? Wow. Oh. Good, whoever got that one, wow. <laughs> so these are hard questions. <laughs> well, I mean, it'd be real nice if we could just stop the drugs at the border and keep them from coming across the border, if we could shut that down. But as Mason County Commissioner, that's out of my hands. Um, all we can do is crack down law enforcement wise on these individuals and make more arrests and patrol the buses. Um, I don't know what their budget's like. Uh, um, I've only ridden on the bus once and I don't know if they have cameras or not, but that might be some options there as well to, uh, um, to deal with uh, the transit. So I, I don't have any more to offer because I don't know any more about that subject. Randy Nedlin, same question. How would you propose to stop drug availability on Mason Transit buses? Whoever wrote that one, you're going to cost me sleep tonight because I have one of these issues. When I have a problem I can't figure out, I can't sleep until I figure it out. I never thought about that. I'm on the transit. Whoever's elected will be on the board of directors for the transit authority. So it really is something that we're supposed to think about and look at for an answer. I just never had. I know I don't want Emma to go back there in the back of the bus and try and, and, and stop a, a, a druggie from selling anything. I know that uh, 
we can't just use the cameras because that's an invasion of privacy at the same time. Uh, even our, our unions won't allow those cameras to be used for anything other than specific things. We've got another member back here. We're going to be talking about that one, but uh, I don't know that there's a, a simple solution. So I wish I could tell you, but I'm just going to have to lose some sleep and try to think of an option. The only way to get them to keep from having drugs on there is to never let them on there in the first place, and that's to get them out of the community before they can do that terrible thing on the bus. Right, Ted Jackson, same question. How would you propose to stop drug availability on Mason Transit buses? Well, as I told you earlier, 35 years as a cop, I'd arrest him. Uh, it's very simple. You bring drugs onto a bus, uh, you're affecting everybody else. You're affecting the driver's safety. You're affecting the other people on there. And we, we need to arrest people. I'm sorry. We got, we got to go back to those days where if you violate a law, you get arrested. And uh, I'm sorry. I did it for 35 years. That's my DNA. And I will do it again if I was given the opportunity. You don't bring meth on a bus. What happens to that driver uh, when you got some guy whacked out on meth or some gal whacked out on meth? Don't do it. So. And I do disagree with uh, Randy. I put cameras on. I put cameras on the buses. And so we could uh, get these violators out of here. Uh, Mason County has a drug problem. So, thanks. Okay, 30 seconds for follow up, starting with Richard. Okay. Well. I agree with what he said there. Um, it's all about law enforcement and stopping them in their tracks. So uh, let's put the hammer down. Let's incarcerate them for, for trying to take drugs on the bus and give them the opportunity to leave our county. And Randy, back to you for 30 seconds to follow. And just for clarification, we actually have cameras on the bus, but there's agreements with the unions that we don't use them to look at the, the employees and stuff unless there's an actual interaction or a problem. There may also be the same kind of issue with the citizens at the same time. When something happens, then we do use those cameras. So they are, are already there. Again, though, I remember that TV commercial with the guy that was uh, uh, a monitor? Uh, we're being robbed, we're being robbed. Well, I know we are, but I'm a monitor. Everybody, we're being robbed. He monitored, that's good, but that doesn't do anything. So the camera alone doesn't do anything. Law enforcement's the only one that's going to make an impact. Ted Jackson, 30 seconds. Yeah, and I, I agree with these gentlemen up here, but I, I don't want to sound callous, uh, but we have to stop people from doing bad behavior that affects us, our quality of life. Uh, my quality of life, I value every day. Uh, I don't care if I get elected. I care about my family. Uh, my God and my country and I got 10 seconds so get these people out of here I'm sorry so <laughs> okay I'm going to modify this question a little bit just to make it I think more easier for me to read and easier to answer we'll start with Randy Netherland as a uh, if elected commissioner can you and would you advocate lowering the sales tax rate in the county? Uh, I am a county commissioner, and that is something that everything that we do bring in is accounted for. If I lower the sales tax, I'm going to have to probably find a way to start laying some people off. We've got things to a good equilibrium. Yes, I have money in the bank, but we've got to the point now to where every year we're now at staying even or we're going to lose a million or two million out of that money. So if I cut sales tax, not, I'm not even sure I can. I'm just telling you, if, if, if I did, I know there's a ramification that goes with that, and it's just not that simple. Okay. So, same question to Ted Jackson. If elected as commissioner, would you, uh, I'm, I'm winging it here, would you advocate and pursue lowering sales tax, the sales tax rate in the county? I hate taxes, but no, I wouldn't. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, we, we are one of the, I buy goods in Mason County because I don't want to go to Pierce County or Kitsap County mm -hmm. to pay a higher sales tax. So, no, I wouldn't. And, and I know, having been a Mason County Sheriff's uh, Deputy, I know what it takes to run this county. And so, no, I, I'm sorry, I wouldn't. I wouldn't cut it. So, and, and how many times do we get to say no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Bowman, same question. Uh, 
Richard Beckman, if elected commissioner, would you advocate and or pursue lowering the sales tax rate in the county? Well, I'm a businessman and I know what it's like to operate on a budget. And the county already has their budget in place. And so over a period of time, if that was something that we could actually do and still maintain the services that we have or that we need, that'd be something I would take a look at. But uh, I will not, I, I'm not going to raise taxes. So. 30 seconds, back to Randy. Just like property tax, everybody thinks we get it, but we don't. We get a small little percentage of it. Same thing with sales tax. The county doesn't get all that. We only get a small percentage. So if we do a sales tax cut, we lose a huge amount of our money. And as I told you before, I get $10 million a year in from property tax. I get $10 million in, in sales tax. And 87% uh, of, of our budget is employees. And of the super majority of our budget is the sheriff's department. So if I cut and lose a million or two million, how many deputies do I lay off? Because that's the question I actually have to ask as a guy who's a city commissioner before I would make a decision like that. So, as somebody that's actually used our emergency services, I fell off the ladder five years ago and I was very seriously injured. Four firefighters showed up at my house. I would hate to see those services disappear. Uh, if it wasn't for those firefighters, I would probably been in a lot worse shape. So, uh, no. Thanks. Dan Richard. Well, I'd like to see uh, more sheriffs on the road instead of less. And, and so by cutting that tax, I don't know if that, that's going to cut it for us. Like I said, uh, you know, we might have a couple sheriffs out there on the road. I think we need more. And by making that cut, I think it might hurt us financially as a county. So, process question here. So that was that rounds out, you know, an equal flow of, of uh, participant questions. So we got to balance across all the candidates. Okay. You want to wrap it up there, or what do you? What Does do you anyone want? have any more questions at this time? You can raise your hand and ask everything. I got a question. I've been here since 1987. And I've had quite a few different commissioners um, that's been in my district. I have called some of those and have had a hard time getting an audience with them or they bring their friends with them. I gave up calling them. We got one commissioner. This question is not for you, Randy. This question is for you, too. We got one commissioner that gives out his home phone number. Doesn't matter where you live in the county. You get a phone call, he calls you back, or he answers the phone. You want him to come to your birthday party, he comes to your birthday party. That's the kind of people that we need in office that care about our citizens. Are you guys willing to do that and get out and talk to the people and get their input and be part of us? Because we don't have commissioners other than Randy that do that. And we need that. Because we can talk to you about anything. And we get, it's not a dumb question, it's not a stupid idea. We may not get the answer we want, but we get an answer. So I'm hoping that you guys can do the same thing or are willing to do that. Um, like I said, I'm a business owner and I have an open door policy. Um, I deal with all kinds of questions and help people succeed in life in a lot of different ways. And as county commissioner, I plan on doing the same thing. I have an open door policy. Um, I, I plan on being out there and having meet and greets, meet with the citizens and taking that information back so I know what to do at, at the county. So it's an open door policy. Giving my cell phone out to everybody. Wow, that's gonna make me really busy. <laughs> but, I like the meet and greet idea better, but I can give myself a number out there. <laughs> okay, so I think we go to Randy then. Oh. Uh, answer. I do give out my cell phone number to everybody. And yes, it does take up all my time quite often, especially like we were talking about during COVID. It, the, the phone never ended, uh, the phone ringing. You know, when I first started, they made me pay for anything over 400 minutes, and I used to pay out of my pocket that I used 3,500 minutes. And I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, that is who I am and, and what I do. One better, one of the things I've sitting here by, I noticed 
in this conversation is how many stupid numbers I know now. But you know what? You get to know those numbers because you are talking to somebody, a citizen, and they ask you a question. You've got to find out the answer. That's how you have the communication. That's how you work with each other. But that's how you pick up the knowledge in order to do the job that we need to do as a commissioner. So, yeah, I can't take my number back. As a matter of fact, I think I gave it out at least a half a dozen times today. It's on my business card. And on my business card it says, I tell you, if you want to talk to the county, knock yourself out. Because there's six numbers. If you want to talk to me, call my cell phone. Good job. Yeah, hey, hey Mark, great question. I was on call for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Every day, every night, you could ask my wife, the phone rang, I answered it. I believe in that. In the years that I was at the United Way, my office staff called me every time I picked it up, and I would do it again. One thing I will ask everybody in this room, do not call our personal cell phones. Uh, that's open for public disclosure. And as a county commissioner or as an elected person, we don't want to fill out the forms. Uh, call, call the cell phone, I'll pick it up. Obviously, I'll pick it up. So, like I said, win or lose this election, I'm a Mason County resident and damn proud to be one of them. So. Should we do a closing statement from each other? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Closing statement. And we'll go back where we started with, um, yeah, where did we leave off? This is the hard part about the question. <laughs> Let's do a two-minute closing statement. Okay. Yeah, is that, you feel like That's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we, we started with yeah. Ted. So we'll start with Ted for closing statements. I'm going to make mine short. Um, I very appreciate uh, being here tonight with Steve Dunkel, uh, these gentlemen here, uh, beautiful people. Uh, Judge, I'm glad you're here. So life changes in every direction. And some people would say, why are you putting your name in the hat again? Well, I could run against my good friend, Randy. Uh, I just have a little different vision. That's, that's it. That's all I have is a different vision. And people may say, yeah, you're right or you're wrong. Okay, so uh, that's me. So I am, like I said before a hundred times, I've, I'm here because of my family. Uh, they have a house, they want to live here in this community. I want to be part of it. So I, I, I won't take up too much of your time. I hope you have some questions for me. I'm better one-on-one. -on -one. So. <laughs> Richard Beckman, two minute closing statement. All right. Uh, for one, I'm sorry that the uh, two other people running for di district number two didn't show up to give their feedback tonight. Uh, that's a shame. But for me, I don't need this county job. I'm just tired of the way things are going. I want change. We have a very successful real estate firm. And yes, there are headaches in every business, but we get through them, we solve them. And that's the same with the county. The county has issues that we need to jump on and that we need to solve and we need to move forward on. If you want what we have right now, if you don't want change, if you like the way things are, vote for the other two candidates. Mm -hmm. If you want change and you want someone that's going to get stuff done, I'm your guy. Vote Beckman. Tell five of your friends, vote Beckman. And just one more time, vote Beckman. <laughs> when I first ran for office and got elected, I had a few goals that I was hoping to be. I was hoping to be the commissioner that you would actually want to have. The uh, person that would actually answer their telephone, as you heard, a person who would show up whatever you call them, no matter what it is, a person that would actually take into consideration everything you wanted, even if I was against it. You see, I have no problem empowering you to do what you need to do, even if I'm on the complete opposite side of you. That's what makes me different than most people. You can't have my vote, but I can't even have my vote. I've had things that I've voted against or for that I certainly didn't want to, but the law said you should, so you do. If you don't like the rule, you have to change it. 
One of the things I had to tell you, though, in order to be successful in anything, especially you want to take care of people, the very first thing you have to do is be there. With that being said, I've got a couple of people here that are here. They're here for you. God bless them on that. Really. Because how is somebody going to represent you if they're not even there for you? That's the simplicity of running for office and being an elected official. And I'll throw in one more little thing as you sit there and you look at all of us. I ask you to consider something. What kind of mask are we wearing? You see, people ask me when I first got elected, they ask me, Randy, how did you keep from changing? Because I'm the same guy in every room I go. You may not like what I say, but I'll tell you the same thing wherever I go. How do you keep from changing? Everybody in politics always changes, and I explain to them, no, they didn't. Their mask fell off. And now you see who they really were when they were running the whole time. As somebody that's been up on the stage with people, I've been afterwards, after debates, going outside going, holy, that's what that person's really like? You don't see it, but you need to. Look and decide for yourself what's behind the mask. But also remember, never forget those that are there for you. Even if we're running against the other, it doesn't matter. He's here, and he has been for years. So I have no qualms with that. I'm appreciative of him wanting to spend time in the community that he loves like I do. Great job tonight, you guys. Let's give him one more round of applause.